sustainable agriculture. The scope is primarily crops and livestock production systems. Um, we have 11 themes and 11 indicators under the framework of SDG 241, which are spread across three dimensions, economic with three indicators, environment with five indicators, and social with uh, three indicators respectively. Plus the periodicity of the indicator is, uh, is three years and the data collection tool that is proposed by FAO to monitor progress towards, uh, uh, to measure and monitor SG241 is, uh, is farm survey. Now with this uh, very brief recollection from yesterday, um, um, we will resume from where we left. I will try to sift through quickly through the slides so that the rest of the sessions are, uh, are not disturbed because we have a very heavy agenda for today. And there are other colleagues uh, from, uh, from Canada and from um, both the headquarters, our survey team, the Agris team, will join us uh, to present to you uh, uh, their presentations. So without any further delay, let me immediately start with uh, with where we left the presentation yesterday. So Stefania, can you please confirm if you can see my presentation? Yes. Perfect. So the sixth uh, indicator within the framework of SDG 241 is management of, uh, of fertilizers. In the context of 241, sustainable agriculture implies that the level of chemicals, synthetic chemicals in the soil and water body remains within acceptable uh, thresholds. The dimension is obviously, as I mentioned, environmental. The theme is fertilizer pollution risk. The coverage of this sub-indicator sub, sub is to all farm types, both household and non-household crop, livestock, and mix, as well as irrigated and non-irrigated uh, holdings. And the reference period for this uh, indicator is last uh, uh, calendar year. Now, the sub-indicator is constructed using data collected through a set of questions asked to the farmers. Uh, these questions are about uh, their use of fertilizers, in, par in particular the synthetic and mineral fertilizer and animal manure and slurry. Their awareness about the environmental risks associated with the use of fertilizers and their behavior in terms of plant nutrient management. So I'm not going to go through these management measures. These, has, these have been um, uh, shortlisted and selected in consultation with both in-house and external experts. Uh, you can, these are fairly straightforward uh, and uh, you, can, uh, you can see these in, uh, in the methodological note as well as the presentations that we shared with you, with you yesterday. But broadly speaking, um, these practices about, are about how uh, well managed the uh, fertilizer uh, application is uh, at the farm level uh, for fertilization of, uh, of, uh, of crops. So the way this indicator is, the threshold for this indicator is, uh, is, is designed. Um, basically, the farm are classified as green uh, if they are not using any fertilizer. Again, the approach here is to see the impact of the agriculture on the environment. So we are not uh, looking at the productivity or efficiency of the farm for, uh, for the use of fertilizer, but rather as to whether fertilizer is used on the farm that will contribute negatively to the, to the, to the, to the environment. So if the farm is not using any fertilizer from an environmental perspective, is not doing any harm and hence it is classified as green. If the farm uses fertilizers, but take at least four specific measures to mitigate the environmental related risks. So we have eight measures, which I showed you on the previous slide. Again, um, um, I, I'm, I'm referring to that. So out of these eight, if the country or if the particular farm that, uh, that is currently being interviewed or uh, surveyed, if they follow any of the four of these eight 
the farm will be classified as green. Now, if the farm uses fertilizer and at least uh, take at least two measures to mitigate the environmental risk, again, out of the eight, if the farm is adhering to uh, only two of these uh, selected management measures of fertilizer, it will be classified as, uh, as yellow uh, or uh, acceptable level of sustainability. And the farm is classified as red if the, if the, if the farm is not taking any specific measure. So out of these eight, if the farm is not taking any one, then the farm obviously will be classified as red because it's not doing anything in terms of fertilizer application to safeguard the environment. Again, uh, the Bangladesh uh, example. So we asked these five questions to the uh, um, uh, holder of the agriculture holding or of the farm. So the first question asked is as to whether the farm use fertilizer. And if they say yes, then we ask the follow up question as of the eight measures, of course, explaining to them what these measures are about, to what extent are they adhering, you know, or which practices are they employing on their agriculture land. So in the first case, as you see, the farm is only practicing two of the measures which were shown on the previous slide. Hence, it is uh, uh, classified as acceptable. The second farm is uh, um, taking no measures and hence it's not sustainable. Um, and then, you know, on 37, as you can see here, the farm is using uh, no fertilizer uh, for its uh, agriculture production. Hence, we classify it as, it as green. And likewise, uh, number 39, as you can see, the farm is still using fertilizer, but they are taking four measures out of the eight, hence it is classified as green as well. Now, to calculate the proportion of agriculture area by sustainability status, of course, the step is the same. We, you know, aggregate the uh, agriculture area for the farms that have been classified as green. Uh, we aggregate the uh, farms that have been classified as yellow uh, and, and, and uh, respectively as red. And then we divide it by the total agriculture area of the country to arrive at uh, um, proportions uh, uh, or percentages for, for this particular sub-indicator. So if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask. If not, then I will go to the next slide, which is on management of uh, fertilizer, uh, by management of pesticides, which is the seventh uh, sub-indicator in the SDG 241 framework. To contextualize pesticides are important inputs in modern agriculture for both crops and livestock, but if not well managed, they can cause harm to people's health or the environment. The proposed sub-indicator is based on the information uh, on the use of fertilizer on the farm, the type of fertilizer, uh, pesticide use, sorry, excuse me for that. So we are talking about pesticides, the type of pesticide use and the type of measure taken to mitigate the associated risks. Again, the dimension obviously is environment. The theme is pesticide risk. The coverage is all farm types and the reference period is last calendar year. Now, again, on the similar lines for the fertilizer sub-indicator, the management of pesticide, we are proposing two set of measures. One is uh, health measures as to whether the pesticide uh, has uh, you know, been used as any um, adverse effects on the human health and what is the agriculture holding doing to mitigate those kind of risks and environmental measures at, as to whether the pesticide being used on the holding has any um, negative impact on the environment and what the agriculture um, holding or the farm is doing to mitigate those risks. So just to quickly go through the health related measures. So adherence to label directions for the pesticide use including use of protection equipment while applying pesticides. The second one is maintenance and cleansing of protection equipment after use. 
and the third one is pay, safe disposal of the of the of the waste which ones like say for example cotton bottles or bags on uh, you know um, um, whether those were disposed of uh, appropriately and likewise for the environmental uh, uh, measures we have uh, we have seven uh, seven uh, uh, measures now again these have been um, discussed thoroughly with experts with uh, both in house and external uh, with country representatives and after a thorough discussion with the with the with the experts we came up with the, with the proposed uh, measures for health and environment now the way this uh, the threshold for this uh, sub indicator is designed um, again if the farms are not using any pesticides they are not contributing to any health related or environment related problems and hence the farm is by default classified as green now if the farm uses only moderately or slightly hazardous pesticides um, what do we mean by moderately or slightly hazardous pesticides i mean these are of course defined by world health organization uh, class 2 uh, or uh, class 3 pesticides i mean it's already given in the methodological note the reference to the to the who document from which we have taken this uh, this definition so if the farm farm only use moderately or slightly hazardous pesticides in this case it adheres to three health related measures and at least four out of the seven environment related measures so as you can see here if the farm is not using any pesticide by default it is green if it is using pesticide but the pesticide are moderately or slightly hazardous then in that case the farm should adhere to a, all three health related measures plus four of the seven environment related measures based on which the farm will be classified as uh, as green um, if uh, for yellow if the farm uses only moderately or slightly hazardous pesticides again who class two or three and take at least two measures um, each from health and environment related measures so if the farm still use moderately and slightly hazardous pesticide take two from the health related measures and two from the environment related measures then it will be classified as yellow and for red if the farm use highly or extremely hazardous pesticide which is defined by who as class 1a and 1b or illegal pesticides then it will be classified as red or if the farm still uses moderately or slightly hazardous pesticides without taking specific measure to mitigate environment or health related risks associated with, with, with their use, fewer, fewer than two in each category. So if the farm use uh, extremely or highly hazardous pesticides or uh, illegal pesticides, then by default, whether or not it's taking any measure, it will be classified as, uh, as red but if it is using moderately and slightly hazardous pesticide then in that case um, it uh, 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 if it is taking less than two measures like say for example one health related measure and one environment related measure or none of these then the farm will be classified as uh, as red or if the farm is taking all three health related measures and none from the environment still it will be classified as red so it's a combination of uh, of both these measures so based on the bangladesh data i mean of course we were interested in um, uh, you know we every single agriculture holding that we uh, interviewed or surveyed all of them use uh, pesticides uh, one way or the other but if the first the quest, the answer to the first question is as to whether you use pesticide is no then by default that farm will be classified as green now for um, for uh, holding one, they said, yes, we use pesticide. The follow-up question was as to whether you use moderately or slightly uh, hazardous pesticide or extremely or highly um, um, uh, uh, hazardous pesticides. And in that case, they said that we use highly or extremely hazardous pesticide as well as illegal pesticide, which, which, was, very, which was very strange. 
they take two measure from the environment and two measure from the health but they are still classified as non sustainable because the the condition the very first condition is not fulfilled which is if you use highly and extremely hazardous pesticide or illegal pesticide by default no matter how many measures you take from the health or environment you are still considered as non sustainable uh, holding to yes uh, i use moderately or slightly hazardous pesticide and then take it two two measures from environment and two from health um, so they they are considered acceptable and so on and again the last uh, step i need not to explain it any further we aggregate the area classified as green and yellows and reds divided by the respective uh, representative national agriculture area to calculate the proportions for this uh, for this indicator the next session so the the eighth sub indicator and the last one in the environmental dimension is use of agro biodiversity supportive practices um let me tell you uh, one thing which is which is good for you information that this sub, sub indicator was subject of discussion of very intense discussion in fact and refinement in, throughout 2019 as part of the 2020 comprehensive re review of the global indicators framework um these discussion involved uh, a country led working group uh, which was uh, coordinated by canada and other members included brazil usa argentina chile france and russia i mean this group was really very concerned about the formulation and the criteria that we have selected for this particular uh, for this particular sub indicator and hence they wanted us to review it and uh, you know basically wanted us to um, to modify it and or refine it so after an year long discussion and consultation which was entirely led by the the group of the countries which i just named by the end of 2019 a compromised consensus was reached on the indicator criteria amongst fao um and 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 and, and these uh, in these countries so uh, this com compromised consensus um once reached was uh, tabled again for iaeg sdg review interagency expert group on sustainable development goal which is again let me refresh your memories it's composed of 28 countries uh, uh, you know representing their respective region where the group reapproved and endorsed it in november 2019 now from the methodological perspective the sub indicator measures the level of adoption of agro biodiversity supportive practices by the farm at the ecosystem species and genetic levels for both crops and livestock uh, one other important point that i would like you to basically keep in your mind for each sub indicator up until now as a denominator we have always been talking about the agriculture land area of the farm as a denominator for us to calculate the proportions in case of this sub indicator on biodiversity the scope of this indicator is the entire area of the farm holding as opposed to the agriculture land area so this is this is the key differentiating uh, uh, factor amongst this sub indicator and the rest the reason being that you know still there are some areas which are dedicated to uh, biodiversity related uh, um uh, practices by the farm which which are not considered as part of the agriculture land area and hence you know for us to estimate the true extent to which the farm is uh, contributing to biodiversity supportive practices we need not only to take into account agriculture area but uh, the area which is uh, which is used for natural vegetation so based on uh, whether uh, um, certified organic agriculture its practice at the country level two set of measures or criteria are proposed one for country countries that who are practicing um, uh, organic agriculture and a set of practices or measures for countries uh, who are practicing uh, traditional agriculture 
So the countries with, with no organic agriculture certification system in place, in this case, they will be evaluated for this indicator based on the, based on the five uh, criteria which are listed here. Um, of course, I'm not gonna go into the details of the criteria, you can, you can read it here. These are as well given in the methodological note and further explained in the, uh, in the documents. But um, um, you know, the only difference between these five measures and the one um, which are set for countries with organic certification is only number two, okay? So rest of the measures of the five measures remain the same for both set of countries either with or without organic certification. But if the country is practicing organic certification, then we will, we added a criteria, uh, which is farm produces agriculture products that are organically certified or its products are undergoing the certification process. It applies only to countries with certification. And there are many other, uh, uh, five other criteria, which I just explained that those remain the same for both set of countries. Now, in terms of um, um, uh, threshold, of course, now that we have two set of measures for, for two set of countries, we need to have um, uh, two set of uh, criteria as well to assign uh, or threshold as well to assign green, yellow and red statuses. So for the countries with organic certification, the agriculture holding needs at least three of the six criteria. Uh, is highlighted as green, yellow, if the agriculture holding meets at least one of the above criteria, and red, the agriculture holding meets none of the above criteria. Um, and the countries with no um, organic certification system in place, the agriculture holding meets at least two of the five criteria. Uh, yellow, if the agriculture holding meets at least one of the above criteria, and uh, you know, red if the agriculture holding meets none of the above criteria. And then of course we estimate the percentages accordingly. Now, you know, one point which I would like to clarify is that all these information and these uh, thresholds uh, that I'm showing you now, these are, these are framed into or designed into questions, uh, which are part of the 241 survey questionnaire or module that we have developed that we will, I will explain to you in the, in the next slide, uh, in the next presentation. So, so with this uh, sub indicator, we are done with the five uh, environmental sub indicator. Now, now we, we entered uh, the social dimension. The first uh, indicator within the social dimension is, um, is wage rate in agriculture. The, this team provide information on the on the uh, remuneration of unskilled employees working for the farms that belong to the elementary occupation group as, as uh, defined by the international standard uh, classification of occupation, uh, which we call ISCO 08, code 92 of ILO. In other words, uh, this sub indicator informs about economic risks faced by unskilled workers and how do we define unskilled workers? These are workers who are performing simple and routine tasks in terms of uh, average uh, uh, remuneration received. Uh, and this is, you know, once um, we, we, we have information on the wages received by the unskilled labor, uh, paid by the agriculture holding, then what we do is we benchmark that against the minimum daily national wage rate or the minimum agriculture se sector wage rate if it is exist. Now, one important point that I would like to highlight is that this sub indicator is not applicable to form that employ only family labor. So, so this, uh, this uh, sub indicator is only um, um, applicable to farm that are uh, basically uh, hiring uh, uh, labor to, 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 to manage its agriculture production. Now, in terms of calculating the daily wage rate, we, we do it according to the following formula. It's the total annual compensation paid to the unskilled labor per year, and then uh, total annual hours worked by the laborer. We divide it 
and uh, then multiply by eight to convert into daily wage rate for us to estimate uh, the, um, the compensation. Now, in most of the instances, the farmer would either directly know that how much he's paying on daily basis to the, to the, to the unskilled labor, or maybe he won't know as to how much on average he was paying in the beginning of the year, toward the mid of the year, to and toward the end of the year, or in a high season and low season. From that perspective, we, we ask him, okay, fine. Um, an early basis, how much did you pay to, uh, to your unskilled labor? He has a number in his mind. And then we ask him, okay, for how many days were, was this labor engaged? And then we can calculate the daily wage rate. Now, the criteria uh, for assigning uh, the traffic lights or the green, yellow, and red is very simple. If the wage rate, daily wage, wage rate paid to the unskilled labor is above minimum national wage rate or minimum agriculture sector wage rate, if available, uh, then we classify it as uh, green. Again, as I mentioned to you earlier, this uh, sub indicator is not applicable to farm. Um, uh, who are hire only family labor or who are not hiring any external labor, hence by default they, they will be classified as green. Uh, the farm is um, highlighted as yellow or classified as yellow if the wage rate paid to the unskilled labor is equal to the minimum national wage rate or the minimum agriculture sector wage rate if available. And if the wage rate paid to the unskilled labor is below the minimum national wage rate or the agriculture sector wage rate, then it's classified as red. So again, I mean, um, based on the Bangladesh data, I mean, uh, we, we then um, estimated the proportions of, uh, of uh, uh, agriculture area for, for this particular sub indicator, bright green, yellow, and red. Now, one interesting point that we observed in Bangladesh case was that either the f farms were paying above the national wage rate or below the wage, uh, the national wage rate. So um, minimum agriculture sector wage rate was non-existent in, in Bangladesh. And hence that was the benchmark that we used. There were no farm uh, which was paying, you know, uh, uh, at par with the, with the national wage rate or equal to that. So, so it was either below or above. Um, the, the next indicator is, um, is on food insecurity experience scale uh, or FIES. FIES is uh, uh, already a tier one SDG indicator 2.1.2, meaning it has an established methodology and, and data uh, on it is regularly collected by countries and reported by FAO and hence it is a tier one indicator. Now um, in context of 241, it is customized or tailored uh, um, uh, in, in, in the context of 241, it tries to measure the extent to which the household of the holder of the farm or the owner of the farm are, are food secure despite having uh, some agriculture production. Uh, I will not go into the details of how to estimate the severity of food insecurity using FIES. Uh, first, assuming that many of you may know about this, this sub indicator because it's already an SDG indicator. 2.1.2, which I just mentioned, and secondly, because of the shortage of time. How, however, I will touch upon the basics of its methodology while referring you to the training material and the e-learning courses on the indicator that was published by the FIES team within FAO. So the reference period for this particular uh, sub-indicator is uh, 12 months and the coverage is only household farms. So this is not applicable to non-household sector and the non-household sector by default will be considered as green on, uh, on this sub-indicator. Now, um, in, uh, in short, FIES is a metric of severity of food insecurity that is uh, measured at the household level. It is a statistical measurement scale designed to measure an unobservable or latent trait as we call it. And it's measured based on people direct yes and no responses to the eight questions which are given here. Now, um, what, what these questions help us retrieve or derive is given in this um, um, uh, PDF uh, file. We will of course provide you with more resources as well. So I'm not gonna go into the details of that. 
Um, so the first question refers to the experience of the individual respondents or of the respondent household as a whole. So the respondent could very well be the um, will, will be the uh, head of the uh, household of the of the holding. Um, the questions uh, focuses on self-reported food related behaviors and experiences associated with increasing difficulties in assessing food due to resource constraints. So this is the whole idea behind behind the FIES uh, framework. So uh, once you know, uh, as you go um, from from question number number one to number eight, the the the, the sort of uh, information which is uh, which is sought in this question. Um, um, the, 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 the intensity or the severity of the, of the experience of food insecurity increases as, as, we, as, we, as we go down these questions. So these are the eight standard uh, FIES questions. I will again refrain from going to details of explaining each, uh, each one, which I just explained to you. So here are the you know steps involved in analyzing um, uh, uh, the data one it's collected through the eight fears questions first we prepare the data for analysis so the standard labels are added to the eight fears questions as a second step the data is inputted into the model prepared by fao fears team for uh, parameters estimations um, that is uh, calculation of level of severity of food insecurity associated with each question and each respondent using rush model. Again, rush model, uh, you know, we, we will, uh, it's, uh, it's one of the models within the item response theory. I will not go into the de details of how uh, the model works, but we can always provide you with the detailed information. It's very well documented and uh, very, in a very simple way. In total, uh, two parameters are estimated. One is called the item parameter, uh, which we also technically call the difficulty parameter. Uh, it refers to uh, and are derived from the eight FIES questions and the respondent parameter or the ability parameter that are derived from the number of uh, people who responded to the eight question. The third step is statistical validation, where an assessment is made as to whether depending on the quality of the data collected at the country level, the estimated parameters are valid. The data, that is the data is consistent with the theoretical assumptions of the model. Um, and, and, and then we see as to, as to whether the data can good enough for, for it to be used for us to measure the FIES parameter. Finally, as a last step, we use the FIES information once collected to assign sustainability statuses to the agriculture holding. Now, I will quickly go through this slide. Uh, so so uh, we collect information on the eight FIES question. We, 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 we furnish the data into Excel or SPSS or Stata or any other software where two is for no and one is for yes response. Then as a second step, we add standard labels uh, as required by the model. So instead of the codes that we are using uh, here, uh, this code can, can vary uh, depending on the survey in which these questions are administered. But then we add the standard labels for each question, like worried, healthy, few food, skipped. These are the identifiers or the descriptors within the model through which the model codes uh, you know, identify these questions. And then we replace the one and two with yes and no. As I mentioned to you earlier, the methodology underlying the estimation of parameters for prevalence of severity of food insecurity is based on the item response theory. The item response theory um, measures non-observable or latent traits uh, and rush model is, is used in case of FIERS data, which is one of the several model in item response theory to, to calculate the severity of food insecurity. So, once we input it, data into the model, it gives us the difficulty parameter, which we uh, also call the item parameters. And likewise, we uh, estimate the respondent parameters, which are automatically uh, given to us by the model when the data is plugged in. So 
the respondent parameter, as I mentioned to you earlier, are called the ability parameters. And then we need the frequency of the people who responded to each question uh, uh, and, 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 the, and the raw scores uh, as to how many uh, responses the, the household gave. So for us, the three important, uh, you know, uh, inputs to estimate the severity of food insecurity is the item parameters that are automatically calculated by the model, the ability parameters, the raw scores, and the frequency of the responses, uh, frequency of the household that, that responded to a particular question. Um, all this information, the ability parameters, difficulty parameters are plugged into the, to the simple Excel tool prepared by the FIAS team. Um, it's, uh, it's already linked here. So we plugged in the required information uh, at relevant places within this model. Similarly, so first uh, the, the difficulty parameter or the item parameters are plugged in then the ability parameters or the respondent parameters are plugged in, the standard errors are plugged in, and the uh, frequency uh, of the people responding to each question is plugged in. Um, this helps us estimate the prevalence rate for moderate and severe uh, food insecurity and the prevalence of uh, severe food insecurity. And these are the values that are automatically generated by this Excel tool. And, uh, uh, and these are the values for indicator 2.1.2. But however, in case of 241, we go one step beyond, uh, beyond this. So what we do is basically based on the answers of the, of the respondents to each questions, we then start comparing as to whether the probability of severity of food insecurity for that particular household in comparison to the probability estimated by, by the model for the entire distribution. So we compare the individual household probabilities with the probabilities derived for the entire sample. And based on this, then we have uh, three thresholds. So green are those if the probability of, uh, of uh, household of the holder of the holding or you know, the probability of the household of the holding um, to be moderate to severe food insecure is less than 0.5 and the probability to be severe food insecure is, is less than 0.5. Then we classified it as green. If the probability of the household uh, of the holding to be moderate or severe food insecure is greater than 0.5 and the probability to be severe food insecure is less than 0.5, then we classified it as yellow. And if the uh, probability to be severe food insecure is less than, is greater than 0.5, then we classified it as red. I mean, all this is given here. So, so let me, let me exemplify. So the household one, you know, based on their raw scores, the model estimate their probabilities. Okay. So in this case, their probability to be moderately and severely food secure is zero and the probability to be severely food secure uh, secure is zero as well. So as per, as per uh, you know, the criteria that we have set or the threshold we have set, if moderate to severe food insecure is, uh, probability is, is less than 0.5 and probability to be severe is, is secure is less than 0.5, then it is highlighted, uh, is classified as uh, green. And hence in this case, it's green. Similarly, in both these cases, the probabilities for this household is less than 0.5 it is again green. Let us pick another case. In this case, the probability to be moderately food insecure is greater than 0.5, but the probability to be severely food uh, sick, um, insecure is, is less than 0.5 and it's acceptable. And in this case, in case 13, the probability to be both moderately food insecure and probability to be severely food insecure is greater than 0.5. Hence, it is classified as red or unsustainable. Now, you need not to worry about the complications that I just showed you because it's very simple. All you have to do is to collect information on the eight fears question. And once that information is collected and, and you run the test for statistical validation to see as to whether 
the data fits the theoretical assumption of the model. Rest is very easy. You just plug in all these number into the model that we have, uh, that FAO FIAS team has prepared and it's available freely online and you will get these scores. So don't worry about uh, the complexity that I just showed you, but uh, it's a very simple to, to analyze because just uh, maybe, maybe in a couple of minutes you will be able to uh, do this exercise. Let me quickly go to, so, so based on these probabilities, we assign uh, uh, green, yellow, and red statuses to, to each agriculture holding. And again, the last step remains the same. We aggregate the area green, yellow, and red, and then divided by the national representative uh, uh, agriculture area um, generated or produced using the nationally representative uh, sample survey to estimate the proportions. This is again the case of Bangladesh. As you can see, 95% of the holdings that were interviewed out of the 420 uh, in, 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 in four districts of Bangladesh, 95% of uh, them uh, um, um, were classified as, uh, as the green, okay? So <laughs> the last indicator within the framework of SCG 241 is secure rights to land. Uh, Sandhya, just to inform you, we have already quite a lot of questions. I don't know if you want to finish or maybe you I, want I would to like finish. to finish because okay, uh, perfect. Know, I, yeah, I would like okay. to finish. And then, you know, I will, we will keep on compiling questions, uh, you know, um, and then, then I answer those. Okay. So the last sub indicator is the social uh, dimension and within the framework of 241 is uh, secure rights to, to land tenure. This sub indicator allows assessing sustainability in terms of rights over the use of agriculture land areas. Since agriculture land is a key input for agriculture production, having secure rights over land ensures that the agriculture holding have control over this key asset and does not risk losing the land in the short to medium term. Evidence also shows us that farmers tend to be more productive as they are reluctant, uh, uh, tend to be less productive um, if they have loosely defined rights to their land because they are reluctant to invest um, in, um, if they have limited access to or control of economic resources and services, particularly, particularly land. This uh, sub indicator is applicable to all kinds of farms and the reference period is last uh, calendar year. Now, um, we, we asked four questions within the, within the um, uh, SG241 survey questionnaire. And based on that, we assess the agriculture holding as green, yellow, and red based on these criteria. So um, the holding is classified as green. If the holding has a formal document, which proves the ownership of the holder or the owner, with the name of the holder or holding on it, okay? So it will be classified as green from land tenure perspective. Or if he doesn't have his name of the holder, uh, uh, if he doesn't have a document that has the name uh, of the holder on, on, on it, then in that case, if he, if he can sell it or bequeath it, any parcel of the holding, we still consider that a strong enough right to be classified that agriculture area or farm is green. The farm is uh, highlighted as yellow. If it has a formal document, uh, even if the name of the holder or the holding is not on it and the holding is classified uh, as red. Uh, if they say that we don't have a document, we don't have our name on the document. We don't have any sell or bequeath, right? So in that case, uh, I mean, of course, uh, um, uh, they will be classified as uh, unsustainable. So again, from Bangladesh example, uh, household one, yes, 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 yes. For all four questions, I have formal document. My name is on it. I have the right to sell. I have the right to bequeath, desirable. Yes, I have a formal document. No, my name is not on it. Um, I don't know as to whether I can sell it. I don't know as to whether I can bequeath it. Still be considered as acceptable because he at least have a formal document. Uh, and number five, I don't have a formal document. My name, you know, if you don't have a formal document, we just stop there because your name, etc. So it is non-sustainable. 
uh, the last step remains the same. We calculate the proportions by green, yellow, and red by aggregating the agriculture area of the respective folding, etc. And with this, I come to the end of the, the presentation. I've eaten up most of the time for my next session. So, so we will, um, we will uh, somehow manage it. I mean, no problem. So now that we have covered the, to the indicator in, gener in general, and the 11 sub indicators of 241. Of course, as I mentioned to you earlier, the next step for us was to, you know, come up uh, with, the, with the tools and the processes for uh, data collection on SEG 241. So not only data collection in terms of FAO collecting information from countries uh, on, on the final values of the sub indicator, but the country data collection, okay? So in this respect, we, uh, we started working on the indicator methodology and start translating it into a survey questionnaire or survey module. And then, you know, along with that survey model, we, 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 we developed uh, different uh, documents that will facilitate data collection at the country level. So the uh, data collection instruments. So as I mentioned to you, you know, yesterday, the way the methodology of 241 is designed now, it's around, you know, the only farm survey is the, is the recommended data collection tool to collect information on the 11 sub-indicators of SCG 241. Now for this, as I mentioned to you earlier, we have developed a standalone farm survey questionnaire module that was shared with you as part of the background material before the training, but I will show it to you as part of this presentation as well. And, and likewise, uh, you know, we, we started integrating the SDG 241 questions into Agris survey program and 50 by 2030 initiative. Now, I'm not gonna go into the details of the second, uh, you know, consider, uh, point because this will be covered by my colleague Flavio from, from, from the survey team. So on top of this, the methodological note of 241 as you may have seen that, um, allows the countries to have the flexibility to use alternative data sources to report on SCG 241. Now, what are alternative data sources? Is that the earth observation, geographical information system or remote sensing, administrative records, household surveys, censuses, etc. Now, option one, which is on the farm survey is fully developed, okay? And all the series of documents that will help you collect um, data, process data, analyze data, and then, you know, um, report on, 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 on the data to FAO. All the series of these documents is end-to-end -end finalized and has been shared with you. The work stream on alternative data sources, though the methodology is referring to it, you know, in one of its section towards the very end, um, is not yet finalized. It's still work in progress. Okay, so we we are going to have guidelines on how countries can use all these different um, available data sources or its combination towards the end of uh, uh, next year. So we will have practical guidelines prepared on how countries can use the alternative data sources apart from farm survey uh, to to report on the indicator. So the option one, the standalone survey question, what is it about? It's designed as a module with minimum set of questions. Now the, the module is designed um, in such a way that it can be taken as is by the country as in an administer it as an independent survey, okay? So um, countries can, can uh, take our module, translate it in, into their respective local language and administer it to collect information on 241. Or it can be attached as a module or integrated with existing national farm service. Okay. So, you know, it's modular. So you look at your agriculture survey, see where the questions uh, which we need on 241 are missing within your agriculture um, um, service, and then start plugging in those questions at appropriate places. So this is this is uh, you know what we what we did with uh, 
with SDG 241 survey questionnaire and AGRIS and 50 by 2030 initiative questionnaire. So we took this uh, standalone survey questionnaire module that was developed for 241 and we started plugging in or integrating it with the uh, AGRIS or 50 by 2030 questionnaires. The standalone survey questionnaire has been tested in uh, Mexico, Bangladesh, and Rwanda, um, both from cognitive point of view to, re to refine the design flow, comprehension, recall, and respondent uh, judgment about certain questions. Assess if the questions are, full, are sufficiently and fully understood by a uh, limited number of uh, heterogeneous uh, uh, respondents. Um, then data was uh, collected in Bangladesh, uh, which I was talking about in my previous presentation, to test, uh, you know, um, the, um, the sustainability criteria and then play, do some sensitivity analysis uh, to refine these criteria a bit further. Then uh, um, basically assess the time of the survey, which we noted in Bangladesh to be 50 minutes on average and revise the respective uh, uh, state of scripts and routines. Um, and, and based on that accordingly, the methodological note and support documents. Now, this uh, standalone survey questionnaire has five sections, introduction, area of the holding, economic dimension, uh, question in economic dimensions, uh, question for the environmental dimension, question for the, for the social dimension. This is how it looks like. I mean, of course, we have shared this with you upfront before the training, but we will happily share it with you once again. Uh, this has been translated into three, three UN languages. Uh, of course, apart from English, it has been translated into Arabic, into Spanish, um, and um, in, um, in French. And we have plans to translate this uh, into into Chinese uh, and Russian as well, at least the official UN languages. But in case of Bangladesh, of course, it was translated into Bangla. In case of Mexico, it was translated into Spanish. In case of Rwanda, it was translated into Swahili. So, so um, you know, for you to really, uh, you know, uh, administer this questionnaire in a proper way, if you decide on taking this survey independently administering on, only for 241, which we won't advise, by the way. We would always like you to take some questions from here and integrate it into your agriculture survey, which are missing on 241. So as I mentioned earlier, for this um, um, questionnaire, we have developed all the support documents. So I don't know as to whether you took a look at those documents, but um, we, can, we can again share it with you. So we have an enumerator, enumerator manual. We have um, instruction manual for data entry operations and analysis. We have guidelines on data analysis to compute the sub indicators. We have sampling guidance for 241 and we have a statistical toolkit comprised of code book, tabulation plan and modular data scripts to support data analysis. So, you know, all these support documents which are independent document in its own right uh, covers the entire uh, value chain of SDG 241, uh, uh, you know, data. So it starts with the methodological note. And from the methodological note, if country wishes to collect information on 241, then they have all the necessary means and tools for them to do so. So now uh, I will go through the respective um, um, documents. So the enumerator manual uh, has been developed to train the enumerator, surveyors, and supervisor before their field deployment to administer the questionnaire. Uh, in this very document, we have given the definition of the key terms that the participant has been asking me about as to what, what does it mean? What does that mean? I mean, it's already captured there. So the definition of the key terms, concepts, and the meaning behind the questions asked. Um, you know, it also provides guidance on the use of skip questions and filter questions uh, and gives example of commonly encountered instances or issues when questions and responses may not be easy to administer and record respectively. So this is a complete guidance tool for the enumerator before they go, go to the field and they can keep a copy with them. And while they are administering the survey, they can always refer to this manual for them to um, ask and probe the question appropriately. 
the second uh, uh, guide guidance uh, or manual that we have prepared is instruction manual on data entry operation so once the information is collected in the field what do you do with that so this document then describes the data entry operations all the steps that must be performed in order to organize the collected data into uh, excel spreadsheets or other statistical packages like spss or r or strata um, or others the procedure to process and analyze data collected and construct the 11 sub indicators according to the dashboard approach. Um, uh, you know, of course, uh, the coding, the cleaning, you know, and further processing of the information. And, um, you know, this uh, instruction manual, however, assumes that the enumerators and data analysts who are then crunching the numbers are analyzing the data and processing the information are familiar with the survey questionnaire and the methodology of SCG241. Um, if not, the enumerators and data analysts are strongly encouraged to carefully read and get familiar with the above mentioned um, documents that is the methodological note and the survey questionnaire before proceeding uh, with, uh, with the reading this manual and applying, the, and applying the steps that have been outlined here. Then we have uh, guidelines on data analysis and reporting. This is, uh, can be used both by data producers, you know, the, the, um, the national statistical offices or Ministry of Agriculture and the data users are like, you know, the policy makers. Uh, this is uh, um, uh, meant for uh, um, uh, government data and statistics authorities, which I just mentioned, the private sector, civil society, research and other organization they generate and or use data and statistics for calculating sub indicators of 241. Um, finally, steps on calculation of thresholds and final reporting of the 11 sub indicator as a dashboard has already has always has been provided in this document as well. Then we have a sampling guidance on SCG 241. Uh, some participants were asking question about, you know, how, how, how we, we have designed the sample or how we are approaching the sampling issues of SCG 241. It's already captured in this document. Uh, this document uh, goes into the sampling size, sampling units, frame, reporting unit, estimation domains, um, uh, estimator and certification variables, sample allocation and strata, um, and other issues related to sample selection of SDG 241. E-learning, of course, this is an additional tool that we have been ins insisting you to um, uh, to take. It's a very high level. It's not as intense as the virtual training that we are having now, but it's a very good starting point for you to familiarize yourself with the indicator. Uh, it covers the different aspects of the indicator that we already covered as part of this uh, training. Here are the documents which are available on the SDG 241 webpage, uh, which uh, we have shared with you and will share with you again. So uh, the methodological node, the enumerator manual, the sampling guidance, the guidelines for data interpretations, the guidelines on the computation of the indicators, et cetera. Now, so this was the standalone survey questionnaire and support documents. Now, I'm not gonna go into the detail of this because Flavio Bolliger, my colleague from service team will, uh, will now cover this session in, in more detail. Um, the, idea behind uh, you know us integrating the 241 questions into agri survey program and 50 by 2030 initiative was to uh, basically leverage and capitalize on the scale of these two projects of, of these two big projects in fact that are uh, basically uh, to which fao is a partner along with other multilateral institutions um, to support 50 lower and lower middle income countries with the survey program by 2030. So hence we call it 50 by 2030. Now the two for one questions have been integrated fully into the survey instruments of these two initiatives. I'm not gonna go into the details of this because this will be covered by, as I mentioned by Flavio. Here are some, um, you know, guidance on the, on uh, the agris uh, and, uh, um, 50 by 2030 mainstreaming uh, technical note that we have prepared. We will uh, provide you with, uh, with information on this as well. And finally, the alternative data sources that I told you is still a work in progress, though the methodology refers to it in one of the very last section within the methodological note, you will see 
a similar table like this. Through discussions with, um, with different experts, uh, we were, we arrived at, uh, you know, that we can still use other data collection sources for the respective sub indicator. In some cases, maybe more than one for a single sub indicator, depending on the context uh, of the country and depending on how well, how robust the agricultural statistical system of the country is. So hence, um, we decided that uh, basically, or before that, let me take a step back. The earlier version of the methodology was exactly based on alternative data sources. Then we took a decision that based on country recommendations that it's very difficult for us to integrate information from different data sources for the 11th sub indicators because it involves heavy coordination. It involves expertise which goes beyond the statistical expertise of the National Statistical Office, which is, uh, which is the custodian of uh, the um, agriculture SDGs at the national level. And hence they said that come up with a simplified option whereby we can use one single data collection instrument to report on 241. And hence we, we redrafted the methodological note of 241 to focus on only farm survey, okay? So now we are going back to the, our earlier position. So on top of farm survey, which is already matured and prepared, we are offering alternative uh, sources of information that can be used and leveraged by the countries to report on the respective indicators. Now, before using the alternative data sources, of course, uh, there are conditions uh, or uh, you know, some um, recommendations uh, that we offer before country can use that. So the alternative data sources should respect the recommended certification, that is um, a farm type, uh, household sector, non-household sector, crops, livestock, mix, et cetera. And, and, and at least the data should be available at the same level of territorial desegregation as farm survey. Um, the alternative data sources should capture the same phenomena as proposed by the farm survey uh, to arrive at at least the same the same, uh, you know, picture after a sustainability assessment, because this is a huge problem. If you go by the practices, you will have, you will get an entirely different picture of sustainability if rather than if you go for, uh, for impact assessment. So this was the, the problem that we are trying to tackle toward, you know, between now and the end of this year and early next year before we publish guidelines on the, on the, on the alternative data sources uh, for countries to implement. We will of course test alternative data sources vis-a-vis -vis the farm survey results to see to what extent we can uh, uh, triangulate uh, the results of the two, uh, uh, the two options that we will be, that will be offered. Um, yes, yeah, so and a couple of others compliant with international national standards and classification systems. And then reference year and periodicity should be homogeneous across the, across the sub-indicators. Now, the alternative data sources, of course, if it is already available. So if you are still using farm survey, uh, it's good that alternative data sources are there because they can be used to replace farm survey questions. Um, especially if the alternative data sources uh, response to the criteria that we have designed for uh, for each sub indicator. Remember, data is easy. Data can you know, data can be found in in different sources. No problem. The only problem is, you know, the threshold. Setting the threshold to assign sustainability statuses or the traffic light green, yellow, and red based on alternative data sources. That's the biggest uh, uh, issue that we will try to tackle. Uh, uh, um, in the next few months. Uh, the farm survey can also complement, uh, 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 the alternative data sources can also complement farm survey questions by providing additional contextual information, um, which is helpful to probe the right answers. This can be done upfront, um, uh, you know, by informing the enumerators or the surveyors about the actual sustainability situation. Like say, for example, if an enumerator is going to a certain area, and we know from before, from other sources, that this area is worse in terms of soil degradation, especially water logging and salinization. Then, you know, this information should be fed 
should be given to the enumerator upfront. So once he goes to that area and he is interviewing the farmer and he, he asks him as to whether he has these problems and the farmer say no, uh, no, then the enumerator can probe further based on the a priori knowledge that he has. And it can be also cross used to cross check the farm survey result to identify any inconsistency and to assure its robustness. So exposed evaluation of the farm survey information by triangulating and validating it with the, with the survey result. I will stop here because uh, I don't want to uh, go any further. Of course, uh, I mean, uh, we will uh, have ample time tomorrow to discuss this more. Okay, good. Thank you very much, Spandiyar. I think it's now to give uh, the floor to our colleague, Flavio Bolliger, who is part of the Agri-Survey team. So Flavio, you want to share the screen and introduce uh, yourself to you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it seems that my camera is not working. Not. That's okay. Maybe uh, um, you will be sharing the screen anyway. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the problem is to to share my 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 screen. Ah, okay. And maybe you can. Sh uh, yeah. I will. Okay. So. Let me open it. Okay. Okay. Uh, Flavio, just one request for you because, uh, you know, soon after your presentation, we are going to be joined by our colleague from Canada, mm -hmm. right? So we need to, we need to be very sharp in terms of uh, ah. 30 minutes that, uh, that has been allocated to us. Okay. Mm. Sorry. Yeah, this, this was the... Yeah, but I was sharing the PDF while uh, let me find the... Uh... Okay, let me share the PDF. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but okay. Or you uh, have the the animation? No, 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 no. I mean, no animation. Okay. We we so, just skip some slides. I don't know if the PDF is keeping the slides or not. So my only concern. Okay, let me, let me. Okay, let me try to you know upload from my side. I sent it to you yesterday, Stefania. So yeah, I know. <laughs> I have it for sure. We don't read it again. And just for your information, I mean, of course, I will answer all your questions uh, either today towards the very end or, uh, you know, early morning tomorrow. I mean, so don't worry about that bit that, you know, some of our questions uh, may not be able to, you know, you are not able to answer. So we will do that. Okay. I have it. Sorry. I received the 100 emails uh, mm. and I was losing. Okay, so PDF. Yeah, PowerPoint. Okay. Can you see it? Yes. Okay, good. Okay. So, well, uh, my presentation covers two aspects for data collection. You can go to the, the next slide. Yes. No, no, the first one. <laughs> yeah. So uh, first I will talk about the AgriSurvey program, uh, the projects that we're running, the Agri methodology and how to, uh, to run could be integrated to the Agri methodology. And then uh, I, I will go to feedback initiative, describing uh, the objective of the project, uh, how country, uh, the countries that are on board in the, the initiative, and the data collection approach and tools used by feedback that are proposed for feedback. 
Okay. Uh, well, the AgriSurvey program, um, I, I think it's better to give some background about the AgriSurvey program. In fact, you know, uh, FAO has been uh, providing guidance on census the last 70 years, and but uh, not the same uh, effort in terms of survey, annual survey or continual surveys. Uh, and in fact, um, the, in 2008, the crisis of the com commodities, uh, the community uh, realized that the, um, the level of information, the quantity of data, sound data on agriculture uh, across countries are not so good. And, and uh, uh, a project to start named it uh, uh, Global Strategy to Improve Agricultural Statistics, a, a big project for 15 years. And the first five years is already done. Uh, and during this first five years, uh, a big effort in terms of methodology was developed within the Global Strategy and uh, producing many handbooks for many aspects of agricultural statistics, and especially one handbook named AGRIS. So uh, that is a complete methodology for uh, continual survey, for agricultural survey. Uh, and uh, the last information about more uh, detailed information about uh, uh, agricultural surveys in FAO was from the 80s. So th this all this effort uh, update the methodology. And this book that uh, uh, Arbab just showed, uh, the front page of the handbook, uh, has a complete information how to implement a, a cost-effective uh, survey that goes beyond the traditional data on agriculture and on production, uh, covering also aspects of social, economic, and environmental aspects of the agricultural activity. So, uh, and after that, uh, FAO established this survey team, the new bran uh, branch in, in the statistical division, uh, running this agri survey program. So, promoting the use of this methodology of this. And, and the idea of the program is to help countries to strengthen the national agricultural survey and promote this uh, new broad concept of stati agricultural statistics. And agri is based on a multi-year program, so uh, using uh, um, uh, modern techniques and uh, as I said, covering more broadly the aspects of agriculture. We can go for the next slide. Um, uh, we, we are running uh, the agri survey program with different projects. Two main projects are one uh, funded by USAID that brings technical statistic, uh, assistance to the countries and fin financial support to data collection and uh, Cambodia, Senegal, and Uganda uh, are covered by, by the USA project. And, uh, and another project funded by the Bill Gates Foundation, covering just technical assistance. Uh, and we work with Armenia, Ecuador, Georgia, Kazakhstan, Nepal, and Uruguay. And, and uh, this project started in 2018 and are going to finish next year. Uh, but uh, now we are part of the effort. And this project uh, was a kind of um, pilot for a bigger, bigger, bigger project that's named now Fifth by Third Initiative uh, that had started last year and goes to 2030 and uh, supporting, giving technical assistance and final support. And the onboarding process for the fifth by 13 initiative already started. Uh, we are in the process of engagement of Cambodia and Ethiopia in this moment. 
the SS um, activities um, survey team also provide support to other countries to implement AGRIS, uh, having funds from other sources like uh, the technical cooperation programs of the FAO. The, the TCPs could cover uh, statistics. In this case, we are, uh, we are asked to, to support countries on that. And also other countries that weren't uh, not eligible for fee by third can ask support, but should cover the cost for the technical assistance. Let's go further. Okay, so the AGRIS methodology is a 10-year program, 10-year cycle program of data collection. And uh, it's based on a core uh, questionnaire that is applied every year that covers basically uh, crop and livestock production and rotating models that uh, are used uh, uh, in different years. This schema in, in the screen uh, is a standard scheme, uh, schema where uh, uh, yeah, the model on economy uh, is applied in each year. Uh, label in two in the in the decade, and the model on production methods and environment uh, two twice in, in, during ten the period of ten years, and in the end also the machinery equipment and assets. So uh, this idea to have rotating models is to uh, minimize the burden for the respondent and to cover different asp aspects and uh, with that process we, we can provide the basic statistics every year, the traditional statistics and additional information with less frequency uh, uh, when uh, is not required. Uh, so in the screen, you can have the link for the global strategy for uh, many materials on Agri's methodology, uh, including uh, e-learning courses and uh, templates and questionnaires, and obviously the handbook that is very complete document in terms of methodology on Agri's. Um, so, uh, ah. I did mention uh, before, uh, Agri's methodology was finalized at handbook in, in the beginning of 2018, January 2018 was published. So before uh, the definition of the indicator 241. The indicator 241 uh, was approved by the uh, UN Commission uh, uh, later. So uh, Agri's methodology, as it is in the handbook, do not cover all requirements for 241. So that's why uh, with collaboration with the colleagues of and other colleagues of the team, we uh, developed this uh, document on how to incorporate 241 requirements with uh, you. In, in, in the Agris methodology. And we propose two alternatives. The first alternative is incorporate all requirements in the core model. Uh, it, it means to add more 32 questions uh, in, in the core model. Uh, uh, in this sense, this can be uh, adopted for any year, so we can decide when collect data, the periodicity of 241 uh, recommend uh, it is each three years. Uh, uh, and, and another option, because we have uh, many requirements for 241 already in the core and other models of 241, or of Agris. So another alternative is to uh, incorporate the requirements according the rotating models. And uh, a, a good solution is to incorporate 13 questions uh, in the year that go going with the economic models and other 10 other questions when the year are going with the uh, PMB, the 
production methods and environment model. Uh, so uh, in this case, um, the length of the questionnaire in each year is not so extent, but uh, uh, the indicators, the sub-indicators, uh, some subindicators will refer to one year and other subindicators refer to another year. Uh, consider that sustainability is a more um, uh, stable characteristic of the, of the agriculture, you know, do not change too much from one year to the other, is an option to, to, help to minimize the burden uh, and the complexity of the training uh, uh, on, on the operation of the survey. So that, these are the two options and uh, uh, attached to the, the document to have this already implemented in the standard uh, questionnaire of AGRIS uh, uh, to administer to, to, if we want to, to, to implement these two options. Okay, uh, now about fifth priority initiative. So uh, this is a bigger initiative involving many uh, institutions. And the idea is more or less the same of the AGRIS program to, to enhance the capacity of the countries to, to implement uh, 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 a survey and, and, and provide data statistical data to inform policy and, and to, to provide uh, information to build uh, evidence informed policies in the country, in, but uh, uh, not only on agriculture, but also on rural areas, and uh, have a strong commitment with the SDGs indicators on zero hunger, no? 231, 232, and 241. Uh, and also the gender perspective. So uh, the, the uh, one uh, aim behind the fifth by third initiative is to really to produce the SG indicator linked to zero hunger. So, okay, we can go ahead. Um, there are some countries that, uh, well, the, the initiative involved three, uh, Institution mainly as um, implemented institutions. Uh, that is FAO, World Bank, and IFAD. Uh, FAO is responsible for uh, data production. World Bank on method methods development development methods, and IFAD on the use of data. Uh, and, uh, and the methodology of FIP by 30 combine um, achievements uh, or, or recommendations from AGRIS and also uh, the experience of LSMS as a uh, survey system from World Bank. And uh, there are a number of countries that we are already working with in AGRIS survey program and in LSMS ISI program project. Uh, that are considered uh, pre-selected countries to uh, be engaged on FIFA by 30. So, uh, and as I said, this year we already start the onboarding of Cambodia and Ethiopia, and the idea is in 2021 have the six pre-approved countries on board, Uganda, Cambodia, Senegal, Nigeria, Ethiopia, and Georgia, plus two new countries. In 2021, uh, Burkina Faso, Malawi, Ghana, Tanzania, Armenia, and Nepal, and plus five new countries. And in 2013, the Mali, Myanmar, Kenya, and uh, as approved countries, and more six countries. Uh, the project is a big project and aim to cover 50 low and middle low countries uh, from now to 2030. So uh, you can see that the, this uh, 
FIPA 30 follow more or less the same scheme of AGRIS uh, and have two survey programs. One named Agricultural Survey Program, that's very similar to AGRIS, uh, but instead to have four rotating models, uh, it was defined three rotating models. In fact, we have one rotating model that cover labor and economy, this named income, labor and productivity. Um, the production method environment model, the PME, and machine equipment and assets. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, FIBA to promote also the coverage of non-household farms and household farms that many countries cover only household farms, but the idea is to have a complete coverage of the agricultural activity. And similar to AGRIS, you have the core every year and a cycle of three years with, uh, uh, with um, these models. For two for one, uh, uh, the, the instruments of, of 5 by 30 was developed um, last year. Uh, in fact, the first, first uh, version was finalized in, in July last year, and we are refining up to now. Uh, so, uh, the instruments of FIP by 30 uh, already incorporate all requirements for 2 for 1. And, um, okay, the second survey program, please, uh, Stefan, the next slide. Uh, named Integrated Agricultural and Rural Survey Program. Uh, we have one additional uh, rotating model named income and live standard is um, mainly based on the LSM ISI household survey, uh, collecting data uh, on, on off-farm income and life conditions of the household. And in this case, uh, in this program we have in each three years, uh, non-farm household on the rural areas incorporate to the target population. So uh, the schema is more or less the same, but to have in the in each three years uh, a bigger sample and uh, this additional model. Okay, uh, these are the basic tools of uh, feed by 30, the core, and uh, we, we name it uh, farm income and productivity, the ELP model. Uh, in fact, is not exactly a model, it's really a questionnaire that integrates already core and ELP questions, similar with the PME and, EM, uh, and machine equipment assets. So uh, uh, the material produced for FIFA 30 is already a questionnaire that uh, allocate the questions uh, in a more suitable way um, for uh, uh, the uh, rot rotating model uh, to, to follow a best flow of the, the interviewing. Um, uh, uh, the PME model, the questionnaire, the core plus PME, the production method environment, uh, was selected as the one to receive all requirements of 241. So in the case of the FIPA tools, uh, in the year that goes with PME, the all items of uh, 241 are uh, collected uh, to, all together, the other environment uh, and, and production methods um, information. So that's the solution that we propose for FIP by 30 and uh, for, for this SG indicator. The next slide shows, uh, in fact, the, in, for FIP by 30, uh, we the recommended approach is have um, post planting and post harvest data collection. So two visits, at least two visits 
per season or two visits per year uh, data collection. So uh, this basic questionnaire are um, developed with this approach on more than one visit a, a year. And also uh, we developed the questionnaire for non-household sector that uh, cover the, the questions that apply to non-household sector. There's a special approach on data collection and have all the uh, complements uh, in, in the tools, the overall tools of, of feed by 30. So, um, Argus has one standard approach uh, uh, in the questionnaire that is uh, one visit year uh, approach that should be adapted according to the interest of the country to, to, to do measurement of area or, or to provide data along the year. Uh, in the case of feed by 30, all these variations are already developed and can be applied uh, directly uh, according to the interest of the, of, of the country. Well, that's, that's all. Okay, so we have seen uh, so far uh, all the theoretical parts and notions uh, with us from the yard yesterday and this morning. We have seen the data collection tools. Now, Let's move to another practical part. I will show you uh, how FAO gets the data on the SDG 241 from all the countries. So indeed the SDG uh, 241 uh, questionnaire. We have uh, one single questionnaire that comes in Excel format and it is indeed the key instrument to collect the data from countries. It covers all the three dimensions and uh, of course all the 11 sub indicators that we have seen yesterday and today. It is sent to countries uh, once a year, even if we have seen that the periodicity for the 241 indicator is three years. Why? This is uh, uh, because in this way we can uh, monitor the availability of data on annual basis since it is uh, uh, a brand new indicator identify changes and get the data points through the years. Uh, this is considering also that often we do not get uh, uh, many data, especially now that we are uh, at the starting phase. Assess the country needs in terms of capacity development, for example, the technical assistance and the training on SDG 241, exactly how we did uh, for this uh, virtual training. And lastly, uh, confirm the national focal point contacts, which is uh, uh, always a crucial information for us, uh, so that we are immediately in contact uh, with the appropriate person. What we have done so far. So we have tested the questionnaire in 45 countries through a pilot exercise uh, carried out from December 2019 to April 2020. I'm going to show uh, the results of this pilot test uh, probably tomorrow or uh, uh, later today. Initially, the question was only in English, uh, as Fandaya already mentioned before. We have translated uh, uh, everything in uh, uh, July 2020 into three official UN languages which are Arabic, French, and Spanish. Then we have had our first official dispatch on August 10th, 2020, this year. We have sent a question to 203 countries, including your countries, of course. Uh, the questionnaire has been sent to the SDG 241 focal points, to the general SDG focal points, and to the head of NSO and with copy the FAO local offices and the relevant people. Uh, this time, the deadline for sending the questionnaire back is now set for September 30th, this year, of course. Finally, uh, the next activity will be to translate uh, all the material into the other uh, remaining official UN languages, which, has, which are Chinese and uh, Russian. Here it is shown how uh, the questionnaire is organized. It is composed by eight worksheets. So we have uh, uh, three introductory sections, 
the cover page instructions and the definition. We have three data reporting sections, so one for each dimension. And finally, we have two supplementary information sections for metadata and feedback. We're going to see all these uh, sections in detail uh, in a minute. Uh, this is a preview on how the questionnaire is displayed. You can see the different sheets uh, here uh, below. Okay, so uh, we see now in detail uh, what these uh, eight sections uh, are about. So the first one, the cover page, simply ask uh, country-specific information, meaning the national focal point contact details that uh, as I said, are very important information for us for having a smooth communication with the country immediately. Then there is a page with only instructions on how to complete the questionnaire, and it gives also uh, an overview of the questionnaire structure. Followed by another page that explains uh, the definitions of the key concepts, the terms, and the international standards used across all the questionnaires. The second section is the core of the questionnaire, actually, where the data are requested, so meaning where the countries fill the spaces with their data. This includes, as I said, three all the three dimensions, so uh, the economic dimension with the three sub-indicators, the environmental with the five, and then the social dimension with the last three uh, sub-indicators. This is how it is displayed. So you have, uh, on the left, uh, all the sub-indicators. Uh, then you have uh, uh, the scale of colors. You have the unit of measurement. And then here you have the two columns that you need to fill. So this is environmental and then the social. Last section, we said it's about uh, supplementary information. Uh, so metadata part, quite intuitive. It collects the metadata uh, on country coverage, so source of data, unit of measurement, frequency of data collection, and so on. And finally, the last section is the feedback one, which is a simple uh, uh, survey with 10 questions that help us understanding if some area of the questionnaire still needs improvement. Now let me show you how to fill the questionnaire, uh, so the, all the file Excel properly. The first page, the cover page is like this one. Uh, you need to fill uh, this column uh, on the left uh, with the national focal point contact details. This is, uh, uh, please fill this column. Also, if all this uh, information have, have already been sent to FAO in the past, because this will help us understanding if the focal point has been confirmed or if uh, he or she has been changed through the year, of course. Uh, about that, so these are the focal point contact details we have for your countries. So please have a look. You already have this PowerPoint because I sent it yesterday. Uh, so in case you know that uh, the focal point has changed, uh, please inform us and uh, Afghanistan, we still uh, uh, miss the focal point contact details. For the three data reporting sections, so the economic, social, environmental, you have two columns to fill. The first columns needs to be filled with the values uh, following all these criteria, criteria described here. So, um, we ask to fill only one year. You should, of course, report uh, the most recent one that is available in your country. Uh, the reference is the calendar year from January to December. And then uh, if you don't have any data, uh, you just report zero in case it is not occurring at all, uh, but potentially applicable while you just say NA if it is not applicable at all in your country. The second column, which is not, uh, you should insert explanation uh, in case. 
data are reported using the national definitions so not the ones that are described in the definition worksheet or if the data are reported using a different uh, uh, reference period so not the calendar year from january to december as uh, i just said before and here you also specify the exact year of the data uh, that are referring to so in case you have filled the first column with the value here you write you write the year it is referring to the metadata section uh, is composed by uh, a big table with all the 11 subindicators listed and then you have columns where you can specify all these kinds of metadata listed here so uh, type of uh, variable availability unit of measurement and so on and the last one the feedback section they are six questions with the scale response so from strongly agree to strongly disagree and then we have four open questions uh, uh, to say something uh, uh, more in detail i'm going now uh, to open uh, and the the questionnaire uh, uh, itself just to uh, show you Can you see the the questionnaire now? Yeah. Okay, good. So this is the questionnaire we have sent uh, on the 10th of August. Uh, so this is the, the cover page. You see uh, uh, what we have just described. And then you have on the bottom also uh, some extra information, the structure of the questionnaire, and then you have our uh, uh, contact details just in case you need to, to contact us. Then uh, the instruction is uh, quite a short section. So you have the general instruction and then again explain a little bit more in detail how uh, the questionnaire uh, is composed. The definition section is uh, quite long. This is because uh, whatever uh, um, doubt you have for each term, for each, uh, uh, each definition is really explained here. You see, uh, it's very long. It is also divided by, uh, by dimensions and by uh, sub-indicators. Sub so really, you, you find I would say all the doubts you have, you can find probably here. Very long. We try to, to be exhaustive. Then you have the three, uh, the core of the question, so the three dimensions. Uh, even this one is uh, uh, divided by sub indicators. So you have the three for the economic dimension and the five sub-indicators for the economic, environmental, sorry, and the social dimension. So the three sections, of course, are, uh, are the same, have the same structure. Then the metadata, as I was explaining, as I was explaining, uh, you have everything divided again by sub-indicators, and then you have all this big table that you are free to, to, to fill whatever information you have, of course. And this is quite long as well because it covers all the 11 sub-indicators. And uh, finally, the feedback one, which is uh, really for us for improving the question in the future, six simple questions. Of course, uh, even if you have the scale, you have a space for uh, uh, specifying uh, any other uh, comment you have about this question. And then you have four open questions and always an additional space for telling us whatever suggestion or comment uh, you have. Uh, please let us know if everything is clear or uh, uh, if something is not clear on really uh, the question itself, uh, how to feel it or if you have uh, any doubt. So, as I mentioned before now, uh, let's move to this uh, next presentation, which is the, the, the results of the pilot exercise. Why we have carried out this pilot exercise? Uh, 
what were the objectives? The main scope uh, was to collect test data from 45 pilot countries using uh, uh, the SDG 241 questionnaire test we just saw. Specific, specifically, we wanted to understand the availability of data, although we already knew that availability of data in 2019 would have been uh, low. Assess the feasibility of data collection, understand country readiness in terms of existing national statistical processes and availability of data relevant to sustainable agriculture. Of course, testing the question itself, so its structures and clarity. And finally, evaluate country needs in terms of capacity development and technical support. Uh, as I mentioned already, the pilot test was launched in the December 19. Uh, there has been a coordination and discussion with several countries. And finally, we prepared a final report with all the results in May 2020. Uh, please note that uh, we had some countries that replied after that time, so after May 2020. And unfortunately, they were not part of the final report, and so we don't see them uh, in this presentation. How we selected the 45 countries? We had uh, four big criteria. Uh, so some contributed to the SDG 241 methodological development and refinement. Uh, informal working groups carried out mostly during the 2019. They were Argentina, Brazil, Canada, Chile, France, Russia, and the United States. Then others participated in previous uh, uh, national pilot tests. Uh, these were Bangladesh, Ecuador, Kenya, Kyrgyz Republic, Mexico, and Rwanda. Then we had others that participated in national and regional trainings. Fiji, Malaysia, Vietnam, Oman, Algeria, Egypt, Ethiopia, Malawi, Cameroon, India, Indonesia, and Pakistan. Then we selected some countries that uh, are or will be part of the Agri-Survey program or the 50 by 20 initiatives, initiative. And these are Nepal, Burkina Faso, Ivory Coast, Ghana, Mali, Uganda, Senegal, Cambodia, Georgia, Armenia, and Kazakhstan. And then there were other selected countries. So Belgium, Germany, Italy, UK, Austria, Norway, Sweden, Ireland, and Trinidad and Tobago. Note that some of the countries that I just mentioned were members of the interagency and expert group on sustainable development goals indicators. Now let's move to the results of the pilot test. So what we have got, uh, I would call this slide uh, pilot test in numbers. So we had uh, 32 countries that acknowledged the receipt of the questionnaire, so 71%. We had received 24 questionnaires back, partially filled or completely filled, which was 53%, so a little bit more than a half, uh, which was for us a, a, a very good result. We had 20 filled uh, questionnaires, either for the survey section or the feedback one. Uh, and finally, uh, not finally, no, but the, maybe the most important number is uh, uh, the 16% of the countries, so seven countries provided actual data. And the three uh, stated that they did not have any data. So this is really in a snapshot, not in the snapshot of the uh, results we got. Let's see, as I said, the, the, the most important number probably, the seven that provided actual data. These are the seven countries. We have uh, Canada, UK, Indonesia, and Norway that provided quite a lot of data using existing data, proxies, and expert uh, judgment. Uh, UK also used uh, anecdotal knowledge. Then we have uh, uh, Burkina and Malawi 
that provided one sub-indicators each, and Kazakhstan that provided partial data on three sub-indicators. Other respondents, they didn't report any data. They highlighted that some uh, data were available or partially available for some sub-indicators, and, uh, and thus uh, uh, were unable to report on the sub-indicators or its uh, subset. Probably in the next years, we will get actual data uh, from these countries too. Uh, this is the situation of the data availability by sub-indicators. Uh, we consider the 24 countries, uh, which are the ones that sent the questionnaire back. So in general, we can see that the data availability is low or partial for most of the sub-indicators. Uh, we would say especially the ones in the environmental and in the social uh, dimension. We can easily see that indeed uh, the, least, uh, the least reported are uh, uh, the prevalence of soil degradations, the, one, the ones that are circled, uh, management of pesticides, uh, wage rate in agriculture, and the fierce uh, indicator. Uh, possibly because this kind of information are not usually collected in uh, the agricultural surveys of census. And uh, uh, even if the basic data uh, are collected at country level, but anyway, we know that the two for one methodology requires specific and additional information for the compilation and reporting uh, of all the different uh, sub indicators. Instead, through this chart, we can easily see that the most reported ones were the risk mitigation mechanism and the secure tenure rights to land. Here is visualized the specific overview uh, of the data availability for your countries for all the 11 sub-indicators. We already talked about Indonesia. Uh, Kazakhstan stated to have partially available for the three sub-indicators, uh, but they didn't provide any. And the same was the Nepal. So they seem to have quite a lot of sub-indicators available or anyway partially available or available through proxy but they didn't provide any actual uh, data neither. Uh, analyzing the answers given uh, by the countries, uh, we managed to understand something maybe more specific about few, few indicators. Specifically, uh, the, sub, the two sub-indicators, farm output value and the variation in water availability, are the ones that further clarity on the methodology was required. Uh, the ones that have low data availability are the prevalence of the soil degradation. In fact, we received, uh, uh, we'd say in fact, 18 countries did not have data to calculate it. Wage rate of, in agriculture, 19 countries did not have data to calculate. And uh, food insecurity experience scale, so the, the PS indicator, even 20 countries out of uh, the 24 responded that they did not have data to calculate it. And the use of agrobiodiversity supportive practices apparently uh, was the sub indicators where information were available, but usually only partially available. While for the sub-indicators secure rent rights to land, secure tenure rights to land, uh, the data situation is relatively good. Uh, we imagine that this is due to the reason that the information on land tenure is, is usually collected using census. Uh, in fact, for these uh, sub-indicators, nine countries uh, uh, have agricultural data and one through proxy. Let's go to the short survey section now. Uh, this section is not present anymore in the questionnaire we dispatched in August. We used it only for the pilot phase. It included a series of questions that helped us uh, assess the country data collection methods, uh, their sources, coverages, uh, uh, scope and periodicity, and the technical assistance needs. 
Here we have considered only 20 countries, uh, since not all the 25 that sent the questionnaire back filled this section. This section. Uh, we have asked if the country was already reporting on an indicator on sustainable agriculture, and we got six countries that replied that they currently use uh, proxy, so 30%. In particular, we had Germany that stated to report organically farmed agricultural land. Italy, they stated to report percentage of utilized agricultural area under organic farming. And Sweden that reported, stated to report organic area. 100% of the countries uh, have an agricultural census in place and 13 will have it by the, next, uh, by the next year. 16 countries, which is the 80%, have an agricultural survey in place, and 12 of them will have the next round in the next couple of years. Finally, about the coverage of the census and the surveys, we had nine countries for the survey and seven for the census, that cover both crop, livestock, social, and environmental aspects all together. Then we have investigated on the technical assistance needed for producing and compiling uh, the indicator. So 70%, which is uh, uh, 14 countries, responded that they needed uh, technical assistance. Among them, them uh, 57, uh, they need assistance in the short term and 36 in the medium term. Uh, this is uh, the reason, one of the reasons that why we have organized uh, uh, this virtual training. Only two countries out of the 20 already received the technical support and none stated that the indicator is not applicable for the country, which means that the SDG 2441 is very relevant uh, uh, worldwide. Concerning the feedback section, here we can see in one chart uh, all the questions and the answers through the, the scale from strongly agree to strongly disagree. We can easily see that question one and question five were the question where the countries were more in agreement. So we have sent the question to the right person and no important questions, categories and commodities uh, were missing in the questionnaire. While question three and question six were the ones where the country were more in disagreement. So not all the definitions were completely clear and the time required to fill the question was quite long. Finally, analyzing the open answers, we realized that countries found the SDG 241 methodology challenging in general. Uh, that they needed more guidance on uh, especially the conversation into actors in aggregating disaggregating results and maybe in clear instructions and definitions. We already saw that the lack of data availability and a lack of time series at country level was quite high. Moreover, countries indicated two challenges to indicators the net farm income and the use of agro uh, biodiversity supportive practices. Finally, some suggestions, which indeed we took immediately in consideration, were to organize trainings and uh, evaluate the possibility of using alternative data sources, which is indeed exactly uh, what we did. So in this uh, uh, last uh, slide, we have highlighted some uh, uh, conclusions and next steps. Uh, although the low response rate and the low availability of data, uh, there is a very high level of interest from countries to implement the SDG 241. And we definitely understood that there is a need for capacity development assistance. Looking at the next steps underlined in the report, uh, as already mentioned before, we have translated the SDG 241 material in Arabic, Spanish, and French. We have completed the first dispatch on the 10th of August. 
uh, in progress. We are still in the phase of collecting data, making analysis, gap fillings, quality assurance, quality control processes. We have just started the retail training, so you know you are the first group. And we are also investigating already on the use of alternative data sources. That's it for the uh, pilot uh, phase results. Do we have any questions? Okay, I don't see any question. Aspandaya, do you have any news on the Canada colleagues? I think he's online. He's... Okay, great. Hello, Martin. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can hear you very well. Thank you very much for uh, for uh, you know, to be to be this early morning to present to our esteemed audience. So, uh, would you kindly introduce yourself uh, more formally, and then the floor is yours. So, thank you very much. I'm a senior analyst with uh, Statistics Canada. Uh, been for over 25 years with the division in different section, uh, looking at different farm survey, census of agriculture, and financial. So, the, so different. Uh, a lot of background with different uh, uh, agricultural statistics and farm survey and census. And also some research as well. So uh, I'm a bit more familiar with um, anything related to farm practices as well, because we, we had some surveys uh, following census year uh, since 2001. Uh, which uh, it's called now it's called a farm management sur uh, 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 survey uh, if I speak too fast let me know if I <laughs> raise your hand if I speak to and uh, I, I saw there's a button as well if I, I need yeah so um, I guess Stefania you're going to move the screen and I just need to tell you when to move to the next one Oh, okay, sure. I will share my screen then. Uh, wait, I need to open your presentation. So, Canada. Okay, now I share my screen. Okay. okay. Can you see? Yes. And Perfect. You, and I... I so I am just need to tell you when to go to the next one, is it? How it works? Yes, you Perfect. tell me and okay. I move. Okay. okay, you can go to the next one. So, and how, how much, how much, uh, how many minutes I have this morning? Uh, we, you should have 30 minutes. 30 minutes, okay. So I think I have enough time for also for questions. So, okay. Well, and move to the next Wait, one. Uh, it's not working. Wait, I don't know why. I click and I say next one. My email before was uh, struggling at the beginning. Okay. Good. Okay, so, now it's working. Okay. So um, as as uh, just just I think that the presentation this morning is uh, he, uh, it's just to review our approach that we took to uh, to provide answer to the FAO questionnaire uh, to uh, the indicator 2.41. Uh, we did it in collaboration with uh, uh, our colleague from, uh, as I said, I w I'm with the Agriculture Division of Statistics Canada. We are two separate department and we have a department of uh, uh, Federal Department of Agriculture 
So I have colleagues in uh, in the, the Department of Agriculture who who specialize more into uh, anything related to agriculture, agri environmental uh, indicators. So it was really a collaborative efforts and um, and um, we um, we try to to respect as much as possible the to align with the FAO methodology, uh, like any like like many of you, uh, uh, at first some were pretty straight. We thought we were pretty straightforward. Other we we came with some some measure that we thought they're they're going they they are good proxy response that. But there's like anything else. There's always a data limitation, and I think tomorrow. Uh, I mean, this morning I'm going to try to to see uh, to explain the approach we took, and just to give you some some idea because it's not it's not always uh, easy to uh, to 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 when you receive the questionnaire and to complete it with a timely fashion. Uh, and actually just to mention that we we may have a new version now too, because we kept some work, uh, kept working on it as well on, on some sub indicator where we see, oh, maybe we can we can do a better job. Okay, next slide, please. Sorry, it's not working again. Maybe page down or. or okay. Or, okay. This so, one? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yes. So um, I won't. I won't read all of these because you. For those that are, uh, maybe go to the next one. Uh. You can go to the next slide. Okay, so I will come back to a, a, a like a, a slide that's very similar to the one I just skipped. That's why. Um, one of the challenge that we had it's sometime the uh, reporting sustainability metrics, especially we everything because you know we uh, we transfer we transform everything into Hector or we using so survey information and we also mainly realize to be uh, with other data source including as i said the census of agriculture we're very fortunate in canada we have uh, it's mandatory to have a census of agriculture every 10 years and one every f between those two uh, census there's one that could be uh, depends of government. It could be uh, it could be canceled. But so far, since 1956, we had one every five years, and also we are data rich with. So we use also remote sense sense uh, remote sensing uh, land cover data, and we had uh, a lot of uh, my friends at uh, colleagues at uh, Department of Agriculture also are specialize into uh, into these uh, metrics that that they use either using census data and then a lot of uh, geomet 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 uh, geomatic uh, and maps uh, canada is a really large country uh, very diversified into agroclimatic condition we have uh, roughly how it's organized it's uh, five eco zone but these which are based on um, they are based on the different soil type different uh, in terms of uh, weather condition uh, weather uh, like uh, also uh, the watersheds they have uh, different way to and 
to divide these echo zone and that sh which are actually subdivided into 12 echo regions which are sub subdivided so um to say that when you you try to uh, aggregate it at the national level it's it it also provide uh, uh, quite a challenge as well because each eco region could basically produce a different a different indicator, especially the environmental indicator. So and also uh, one challenge actually that we uh, when you, you even also at the farm level when you you try to extrapolate it could be only one area of the farm that's that that has uh, for example uh, problems with soil erosion and the rest is uh, or so it's it's always how you how do you really do the the extrapolation to to raise it up to the national the province the sub province the some what we call province and then after that it's national level so next slide please so in terms of scope it's pretty like the land use primarily to grow crops and raise livestock there's no issue like the the what what we use as a what we call the denominator for your the for most of indicators is is not is because we have as i said a good census so it's and also we have every every year we have surveys so it's it's not a, a problem uh, in terms of economics as well uh, we were able to provide answer to all the sub the sub indicators i uh, will go through each of, uh, of them quickly or just then tell me if i, I need uh, if i don't environmental i said i put a question mark because in social we 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 use like you see a question mark because we use proxies for for answering some of them other most most i would say most of them for especially for environment but environmental sub indicators but for social we we use uh with some of them we had to use proxy um a farm level with uh, as I, I already mentioned uh, the aggregation uh, problems or issue or chat i would say challenge because nothing is 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 uh, impossible to but uh, one challenge that we face is like especially it's uh, for i hear that's for the last uh, almost eight years or or it's the we we really want to reduce response burden so every effort to reduce survey even the census itself or like we're working uh, maybe in 2026 we'll have more and more use of administrative data or model to estimate some some of the 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 data point that we use to collect through a, a national a national census so and just by the way our national census just quickly explain is uh sent uh, actually now it's all it's, it's mostly electronic because we we had a good like 2016 we had a good response rate 60s more than 65 percent um uh, what i see is it interesting to know that implement remote sensing from cross estimation uh yeah i had some uh kadir had a question from what is main case of response burden in canada uh that sorry uh, uh okay so main response burden is we we calculate it in the number of hours or spend and it's the more surveys farm because farmers get get surveys from us national agency they can get also from 
Uh, Sometimes they receive it from university, they receive it from a questionnaire from, uh, um, it could be for, for example, a fertilizer or a service provider. So they're very solicited to, and for example, we, uh, uh, when we, and now we try to get to get uh, easy way for them to answer questions. So even if they, they uh, some sometime they have, I would, the extreme case where the uh, especially if it's during uh, seeding season in this in the spring, for example, our census of agriculture it's around May the 10, but many farmers are are sowing their or seeding their the soil and they're on their, their tractor so it's not and they're working really long days so so we really try to reduce the number of questionnaires to them and uh, we I think we for the uh, the other question I had for the estimation of uh, crop as uh, we had um, we were able with the model and the remote sensing and some climatic uh, information to to actually reduce one survey that was uh, the September field crop survey where we were able to estimate uh, the um, the area the harvested area and uh, the production for uh, uh, for I forgot the name of its major crops, and the, uh, we had maybe twelve. I forgot exactly. It's, and uh, they we were able to cancel actually the survey because we had we reproduced that survey over the over the we had one in July and we have the number November one that's confirmed the number. So, but that development of uh, I have a colleague who could could actually uh, or actually made other presentation to FAO and and we have some presentation available. So it's something we can make it available. But it's uh, I would say it's it it took a few years to to when I say a few like in in terms of development maybe more than 10 years but let's say intensive 10 years before we transition to cancel the survey and eventually now we we start to uh, even uh, this july there were part of the questionnaire that was assessed through uh, through that method and uh, so so we we're, we're reducing the number of survey this way so I hope it answer but we can come back to question at the end too. Um, just close that through that. Okay. Uh, the, yeah, response burden. I said mentioned already large country team with some indicators. We were, yes, we we're able to have at least, uh, and as I, as I said, we, we can probably, even have, as of today, we can probably uh, send more <laughs> sub indicator to uh, to uh, to answer the F the FAO questionnaire. Uh, but the periodicity for us, okay, every three years, uh, very unlikely. We'll be able to do every five years, and uh, reporting the dashboard. That was something that uh, the concept of uh, uh, was. For us, it was easy to easier to to answer uh, whether it was acceptable or forgot the other one. But so, uh, next slide, please. Uh, as I said earlier, so rich uh, we're rich in terms of data source, census agriculture for five years. And also we have a, an annual census of, of farm taxation, taxation data. So where we have uh, financial data and those are actually uh, linked together. We can actually, every year we link together the, the, the census of the taxation data with 
the farm we had the, the census. So, um, of course, on the taxation, we don't ask for most of the taxation data. We don't have the uh, commodity or, for example, what type of crop they had. They, had, they don't report that information to the taxation agency, but uh, we can do it for those that participate to to farm prog uh, program and um, uh, with the department of agriculture and the uh, so we we had also other alternative source of administrative data that give us that information so basically when we had the output value per per hectare that was pretty straightforward to use uh, use the measure and it, it was desirable um, in terms of profitability was uh, the, it was a bit more difficult because if you want to to follow strictly the the methodology it's like especially at the at the farm level it was uh, we we don't measure um, the, um, for example, value inventory change, income in kind, depreciation at farm level. So uh, for this uh, would would be much easier, <coughs> pardon me, would be much easier to use uh, aggregates that we produce for national account. <coughs> pardon me. And for the risk mitigation, uh, um, most program are open to and they have people uh, uh, a farm producer have access to credit and, and, and insurance even now we have uh, gov government insurance and also some private insurance so uh, we just make an assumption or pro proxy or that it's not it's not uh, it's not a it's not a problem uh, next slide please so now the uh, from the dimension environmental dimension uh, we're not as rich as i said we have as quite many questions relate to farm management uh, on the census of agriculture uh, we had the base question about uh, the land use and uh, the and the area on the different uh, we have a survey that's called every, that I said every five years that follow usually follow the census of agriculture since 2001, and that survey evolved over over time as well because I think we keep improving with. It's not easy, but we keep improving with that survey. Uh, the main it's a it's a it's an uh, agreement with the Department of Agriculture, and uh, we collect the information for them. It's a cost what we uh, based on the cost, and we also uh, have scientist research. And uh, I really encourage you to uh, to to go to the uh, the report that uh, the hyperlink I provide here uh, from uh, my colleague of. Uh, Agriculture, agriculture and agri-food Canada uh, but it tells you a bit of the different approach they took for to some of the measure so next slide please um, so you, you in the questionnaire you have the acceptable for soil degradation so um, most of it like there was four that we were able to we had some measure in in the report i just mentioned earlier so uh so this was uh this was easier to to answer uh next slide and uh, basically because of all the work they've done but uh, when i say easier it was because they already have a report that took a few years to produce and it was based on uh, land covers, land cover area. It was based also as uh, uh, they have different sites on field where they did some field testing. We 
intensive use uh, intensive use of uh, soil maps and so on so um, but they came to like uh, these I won't repeat everything that's there but uh, so uh, low 90% of agricultural land is low to very low risk of soil erosion and it is no increase no change or increase in soil matter actually depending of practice we we for example there were um, over the last 30 years there was a, especially in the prairie provinces where we produce most cereals and we see the uh, pre the practice of no tillage uh, gun uh, was very uh, grew really fast and so it helps to protect uh, soil organ uh, organic matter uh, so that's an that's but now we kind of plateau with that practice because it cannot be applied more in more area uh, 92 percent land susceptible to salinization it's very it's a very small part of canada that had that uh, of uh, canada crop uh, crop land that's susceptible to that it's to that uh, salinization so again if you try to i'm sure if you try to go at uh, using farm practices uh, Sometimes a, a, a measure that's applied doesn't necessarily say that it's applied to the old farm. So you have more chance to measure that these uh, soil degradation using uh, using research of, like uh, on the field and uh, or to observation as well. To uh, um, and the other sub indicator under soil degradation, we had no data. Next slide, please. Okay, so so that was what we need to reach the desirable level. So you can go to the next slide. Where so basically for us it was. Uh, um, the, the, the we farm irrigate less than 10 percent of their agriculture area uh, we didn't use uh, micro data or farm level data there but uh, actually we my colleague when he calculated the the uh, the estimate the uh, the aggregate data that was used for uh, need irrigation and um, this is a, a practice that uh, that uh, measure the, the actual irrigated area is measured on the census. So, um, so it's a combination of the two. Uh, we could have actually get maybe a, a better precision if we had gone to every farm on the census of agriculture. But again, it's. Uh, I I think we would have achieved at the end the same in terms of re answering that question we would have achieved the same result as desirable so next slide please just uh, uh, so uh, acceptable is was uh, no to for fertilizer management it's a uh, to use all these uh, at least two measures so um, so those are many many are actually already used except maybe um, I would say to some yeah to some of extent it's all all used so uh, could you explain sorry I have a question here you explain the term earth observation oh okay sorry i will you can move to the next slide i will uh earth observation is oh yeah okay earth observation is um uh, remote sensing data so we we use uh, remote sensing for 
many, many decades now. It's really when I start in agriculture division, they already had a program in place. So, and um, convert that at first for many years, it was uh, used for the crop condition over to monitor crop condition condition over the season, the season in the in the central province. So let's uh, use a proxy for okay. Uh, I will give you an example, maybe for the why I use a okay. Sorry, uh, can you give example of that you use as proxy for environmental and social? Okay, when I actually uh, this might be a good example of a proxy. Because here we say, like, um, for example, fertilizer management, we say acceptable. Like, for example, the first point, 72% of crop operation apply commercial fertilizer at recommended rate. So we know that the answer to that, the farm management survey, yes, we we this the answer yes to that question but um it doesn't mean that they did that to all their all their crops you can assume they did it for all their crop but for some of them um they may just have especially now with uh, may, many of them are practicing uh, um have machine to have a precision agriculture where it measure exactly area of the of a field that need more fertilizer than another and so on so but overall we said okay we in that case we we use the percentage of of a, of a field crop operation or that that use a method same thing for for the manure and, and composting and so on. So, um, does it then, uh, when I go to social dimension, I, I will also have an example. Does it answer, uh, that was a question from, uh, okay. If you need more example, I can go through. Uh, Okay, next. So those uh, pesticide management, again, from the farm management survey. Um, so yes, it's same idea here. Like we use a proxy because we didn't really need, we didn't really measure the area where the apply the, for example, the, the protocol or the, the use organic uh, nutrient and so on. Or we didn't measure, uh, for example, the, we could, we could probably use uh, the, the census of agriculture, for example, number three, but because we have, uh, uh, we have these, uh, these actors for each of those uh, components, but, um, um, and and uh, okay. So the question is, what did the percentage number give in the proxy Come, farm survey? Uh, it just move to the next slide. So 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 in that one, for example, we we know that those who answer the survey, 98% uh, said, yes, we, we rotate crops. So we don't know the exact, we, we can actually, in that one, we could have got a step further and say, okay, from the, the survey, and we could have extrapolate uh, these crop operation, when you link it with what they report on the census of agriculture for the field crop, then we could have derived uh, the um, the actual ac acreage or ac hectares. Uh, companion crops, 8%, uh, but 
we don't have that uh, which which crop which crop they they use as a combined together. So we didn't measure that in the census of agriculture. This one gets a bit more difficult. So we just know that eight percent do it. Uh, one percent use biopesticide. So, um, so again, is it when they say use biopesticide? Is it for the all the operation, or is it just uh, all the crop, or is it just just some of the crop? So that's you know, it's as you dig further into, uh, you almost need to have a feel, you know, and, and uh, like be an interviewer with the, the farm operator and to try to to measure this. And having a really large country and like us, uh, it'd be very expensive to conduct these surveys. Uh, by the way, the, the method of collecting, uh, maybe I skipped too fast on that, was uh, self-reporting. So the farm, Farm, the farm operator answer this question, the census of question of agriculture of or the farm agriculture, the farm management survey through uh, through uh, electronic questionnaire. Um, and the point as well, like that I tried to say, okay, and I it just give like its answer indirectly. Uh, when you try to exp extrapolate the number of farms and number of operator to the whole farm, uh, are we like in some time it's it possible if we had other measure like if we have the census of agriculture, but then are we getting really close to the true? And so, not necessarily so. And as I said earlier, so it's difficult to have a one national measure because we have different eco region, so eco zone. So one or two eco, eco region could be really acceptable. So you have to kind of weight it to the, to the depending of the area of these uh, regions. Next slide, please. I guess that's the one that uh, that could be, uh, especially with organic certification criteria. It's uh, the but the bio uh, biodiversity sportive practice, uh, for example. Uh, uh, first point here: we we could uh, we don't have everything that. To calculate, like we have on the census, we have uh, we have the uh, the pasture grass. Oops, I lost. Sorry. Sorry, I I lost my screen. I apologize, I just shut down some of the... I lost the zoom, am I... Okay. Okay, can I help you? Uh, that's, I will just find my presentation and because I lost your screen, so. Oh, okay. The Zoom screen, somehow I'm, I'm, I'm still on. Uh, <laughs> so let, let me, if I cannot find you, I have another way to continue. Uh, just, just where I was. Can you remind me just. Uh, so you you lost the zoom uh, interface yeah so uh, which... don't you find it at the bottom i don't know which computer you have i don't oh, okay yeah okay good thank you okay, okay. 
<laughs> so thank you. Uh, biodiversity, yes. So, yeah, for example, um, yes, we have, uh, we could measure at least 10% because we had, for example, the pasture, grassland, and so on, on the census of agriculture. Uh, organic certified, this is, this is, uh, we just know, we just ask on the census of agriculture what, what, uh, if they're certified or not and what's their certification agency but we don't know uh, what's the area or, or what for what kind of uh, livestock their uh, production they're certified so uh, that's something we should we want to improve with uh, with uh, administrative data uh, I won't go to the growth promoters because we don't have information on that. Uh, temporally crop, we we have these information. So basically, those were mainly answered from the uh, the could be answered from the census of agriculture. When it comes to and we had this on the, uh, the crop rotation, it's not always is because we we could ask we just ask them do you have crop rotation or not but uh and based on the mixture of crop we can estimate okay what kind of and the region where they are what kind of patterns crop rotation pattern they use but uh, it's not uh, it's not uh, straightforward next next slide please um, so basically we just this one we we the only answer we we, we have is uh, what was the challenge on this this one we as i said we could continue to improve but uh, do you use biopesticide for specific crop uh, as i said it's just one percent of the, if you go back, that's a question that I had. Uh, so just go back. So the criteria was, or maybe. I, okay, I don't find, maybe it was before anyway. Uh, Biopesticide, I think we had yeah, I feel it was pest management. So uh, it was really the crop operation. So we, we they didn't ask, okay, what crop then? What, you know, when you start to, it becomes really quite complex to, to ask this question. And I, I talked earlier about response burden. So we tried to minimize the number of of minutes or the number it could take hours sometime to take to answer all these uh, the surveys so imagine if you have a field survey and you ask all these questions and now also you try to measure so you can be there for for more than a day so uh, okay you can move forward to one slide or okay now the social dimension so uh, here we have in Canada. There's no, uh, there's minimum wage for sure, but in agri uh, specific to agriculture sector, no. And uh, the thing is, uh, it's uh, so we assess that it's it's uh, des desirable, and uh, wage rate paid to unskilled labor. Uh, we had survey, and we again we can cross. Uh, we can link this survey like labor force survey with uh, agriculture or census of agriculture uh, uh, or some taxation data so it's possible but it requires much more work that we could do for to end the time we had to do the uh, answer the questionnaire so you can go to the next one so as I said, there's no minimum wage or there's one, but it's really 
equivalent it's at the provincial level it's not national and it's there's different law in uh, um, and uh, sometime also we 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 were not we we had difficult we struggle a bit with that question because to link the employees to the specific actors so unless uh, because employees can be used in especially in their it's one hour time we should we be at the end of this training okay uh, i'm almost done here so <laughs> i'd consider i think i have two more slides okay more work using exist time and it's okay so yes so option we will require more work next slide uh, thanks for the reminder so uh my food and security so yes we i think it's we desirable there you can uh, you can go to the next slide so uh and then it's again we could confirm this with the uh, with the census of population and uh, census of agriculture and the labor uh, so but it's again difficult to link employees with actors okay next slide sorry to take too long time um secure tenor rights was not an issue because it's it's uh, every pretty much every farmer has formal documents for about the rights for to, to the the land so and uh, so it's not really a question so next slide and the last one so uh, yeah but there might be some instead of personal property exception so especially for some small uh, like communities like indigenous and uh, and uh, religious community there's no personal rights next slide so yes it's a uh, we, we acknowledge it's a great challenge to measure land sustainability or um 2.41 provides a framework to start measure it then it's um Actually, we've been uh, tried to partner, giving feedback to FAO and and that for that indicator. Uh, we always consider the objective that uh, the discussion we had to it has to be comparable across countries. So sometimes we cannot be perfect, but at least uh, uh, we. Um, we uh, we try to follow as close as possible methodology if not then we have reasonable proxy measure that we're confident for different sub indicator uh, that's the time that's it that was the last slide so if there's a i try to answer some on the chat some answer as i, I went through it so i wish to everyone a successful uh, workshop Thank you very much. Okay. Bye. Okay. Bye bye. Okay. So we are uh, uh, at the end of the day. Um, we have uh, covered uh, quite all the uh, presentation. Actually, uh, we miss only um, uh, the poll uh, exercises, uh, two poll exercises, but maybe we can do this uh, tomorrow. Uh, what do you think, Aspandiar? Yeah, that's perfectly fine. Let's just, uh, you know, do it tomorrow yeah. as we have reached, uh, you know, the time limit for this. Uh, yeah, event. exactly. Even yeah. because we started half an hour before, so we want to yeah. leave the participants sharp today. Yeah, we yeah. are only four minutes late or oh, six. My clock is two minutes uh, late. So we are six minutes late. I think uh, we are quite satisfied. Thank you again. Uh, so see you tomorrow. We see we we keep the the correct time this time, I imagine, right? Yes. So, so we 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 see each, we see each other tomorrow as uh, communicated to you earlier as per the meeting request. So we are not going to start earlier, but as per the time communicated uh, in the in the meeting. Okay. Perfect. Yeah.
Thank you again, Nassim. See you tomorrow for the last day. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you very much, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Mr. Cadavaranto. <laughs>